All right, we are at the top of the hour. We're gonna have a lot of people joining in here in the next couple of minutes, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who've never attended one of these, this is a Corvair Society of America course and meetup. This is a special event that we hold every third Thursday of the month for Corsa members and um, welcome. I wanna share again that this call is muted. Um, you won't be able to unmute yourself. We have lots of material to get through and um, we can use the chat feature for any questions that you might have. And just so you know, several people sent in questions ahead of time and our guest speaker is going to talk about those. Um, I do wanna introduce um, Ken Tiger from Penn Grade One. And uh, he's gonna talk about a subject that is like um, black gold, Texas tea here, oil, which is always an extremely popular topic on the Facebook pages. And I'm gonna tell you right now, he's got lots to share and we might have to bring him back for part two. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Ken so we can get started and uh, take it away, Ken. Thank you very much, Jeanette, for having me. And, and uh, many thanks to all the club members for allowing me into your homes this evening. Uh, as Jen, uh, as um, Jeanette has uh, alluded, there's so much information here um, I've never done this presentation in less than an hour and a half, let alone 45 minutes, allowing some question and answer period. So uh, bear with me. I'll do the best I can. And if we have to come back for a uh, round two, I'm more than willing to do that. But let me begin by, uh, again, just introducing myself. I'm Ken Tiger. I'm with Penn Grade, uh, Penn Grade One, DA Lubricants. And uh, I've worked one of the perks of my job is to work with uh, in or around classic cars and to spend time with great people like yourselves. Let's be honest, this is not a hobby. This is in fact a passion. And all of us at Penn Grade One High Performance Oil certainly understand the passion. One area that is so critical uh, with that passion is engine lubricants. And I hope that uh, by the end of my discussion this evening, uh, you find it interesting and you certainly find it informative. So really to begin, let's get started. I always like to start with a bit of a history lesson. And a lot of people don't realize that the Penn Grade One high performance oil of today is from that same lineage, that pedigree, that, that heritage of the original Kendall GT1 high performance oil that was made famous by individuals like Big Daddy Don Garlitz and Hall of Famer Bruce Larson and for many years, um, it was known under the Brad Penn name. Um, a little bit more on that history. Uh, really, um, it was sailing along quite nicely until the, the Kendall uh, Company in Bradford, Pennsylvania decided to leave Bradford and join the ConocoPhillips family. So what they left behind was this refinery that only processes Pennsylvania grade crude. One of the unique characteristics of the of the original green oil or Penn Grade One is that unique Pennsylvania grade base cut. And we're going to get into more of that uh, in just a few slides. But as you can see in the timeline there, uh, there was quite a bit of activity in a very short time frame. But at the end of the day, the bottom line in 2001 with Kendall gone, uh, the company that took over the refinery, American Refining Group, decided really to start their own blended lubes division. So without the Kendall name, they had to come up with their own. And that was, of course, Brad Penn, short for Bradford, Pennsylvania. So for many years, the original green oil flew under the Brad Penn banner. And in 2015, the brand was acquired by the DA Lubricant Company out of Lebanon, Indiana, who decided to change the Brad Penn name to simply Penn Grade One. Now, what's unique about the 50 plus years of this product's existence? Yes, the name has changed. Yes, the bottle design has changed. But what's inside that bottle has not. You're still afforded that great Pennsylvania grade base cut and I'll get into more detail why that's so appealing to a classic vintage legacy historic car owner, especially a 60s era Corvair. So 
Pennsylvania grade crude, what's very unique about it is it's free of, of natural contaminants. And you're, you're talking about free of asphaltic constituents, trace amounts of nitrogen and sulfur. But what's really appealing to an end user is, is some of the more critical uh, character, performance characteristics. One is a naturally high viscosity index. Now, the higher the viscosity index, the less the viscosity change over a given temperature range. Now, that is a very desirable characteristic of any lubricant. Um, you're talking about a natural metal wetting characteristic that the that a unique cut affords. It's almost like a natural affinity to the metal surfaces, a natural metal wetting uh, characteristic that is literally unparalleled. And pen grade one is the only oil in the entire classic market that will afford you all those unique characteristics. And again, it's all contributed to the Pennsylvania grade base cut. Um, just, to, just to move on, as you can see on the screen, that unique Pennsylvania grade or Pennsylvania grade crude can only be extracted from the Appalachian base. And that would encompass, uh, you know, Western New York, obviously Pennsylvania, uh, Eastern Ohio, uh, Virginia, Northern West Virginia, et cetera. Uh, what's very unique about the Pennsylvania grade base cut is it's really due to the consistency of this base oil you can literally trace the quality of the product from the wellhead to the package good. Okay, so again, this is very unique to Pennsylvania. And as an end user of a classic car, uh, you can certainly afford the characteristics of that unique Pennsylvania grade base cut in the finished form, that being pen grade one. So uh, again, as you can see on the screen, these were many of the companies back in the day that actually process and blended with Pennsylvania grade crew. Everybody recognizes the old Kendall can, some of the old school guys, uh, the two fingers, which indicated the first 2000 mile oil, where uh, again, you had Penn's oil, Quaker State, Wolf said, some of these companies aren't even in existence anymore or have been um, you know, acquired, if you will, and are part of uh, another larger company. So uh, again, when it comes to Penn Grade One and that unique base oil cut, uh, it's really what made the original Kendall GT1 oil what it was back in 1968 when it was first introduced, clear up to 2021, that unique cut is still in there. So. Um, there were so many questions regarding additives, and I and I really wanted to spend the next couple of slides to to really kind of explain, not getting into the technical so much as uh, more the 10, 20,000 foot view because we just don't have the time. But what additive basics, uh, what additives actually do? Um, you know, an an additive is is essentially a material. Uh, that is added to a base oil uh, to change the physical properties and the performance characteristics. And it's not until an additive is introduced to a base oil that the resultant product is a lubricant. So keep that in mind. When you're dealing with uninhibited, unadded, unadditized base oils, they are exactly that. It's only when you add an additive or additives, plural, that it becomes a lubricant. But again, you have physical properties and additives are used to uh, change or alter the performance characteristics. Now, in, in relationship to pen grade one or your high performance classic car oil, you have chemically inert additives that are used to act to improve the physical properties of a lubricant, and you can see there on the list, I've just detailed some that are technically considered chemically inert. And then you have chemically active, um, which interact chemically to the metal surfaces, creating uh, sacrificial film, if you will. Um, some of the more common chemically active additives would certainly be zinc and phosphorus. And those are two words that 
any classic car owner that has to protect their flat tap and cam has certainly heard and done their re, uh, heard enough of and done their research on. Um, this is really a slide that 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 depicts a a completely blended formulated lubricant, and as you can see, you know you have multiple additives at play, and and this is where your formulation chemist earn their big bucks because you take multiple additives that must work in a synergistic fashion. Okay, and we're gonna get into the introduction of aftermarket additives and why they can be so detrimental to the performance. I believe that was one of the questions we had earlier this week that I wanted to go over. But again, this is just essentially how additives work. You have your chemically inert and you have your chemically active, which again, uh, note, you have a lot of those different additives aggressively fighting for the surface. But again, knowing this, they must work in a synergistic fashion. So uh, just real quick, I wanted to get into what you see in the beaker. What, what is actually depicted is the various additives. But more importantly, in a blended lubricant, you can see there on the left where you have uh, the majority of the formulation is base oil where uh, anywhere from 15 to 25%, and in many of the modern licensed oils of today, I've seen as high as 35% additive. So again, the type of base oil and the additives are very critical uh, to, uh, you know, to the resultant product. And obviously the treat rate, you know, all those additives in that beaker, you would see less and less um, depending on the type of system uh, that you're designing the lubricant for. Um, one such example would be transmission fluid. Uh, another example would be differential, okay? But obviously engine oils, uh, uh, you know, clearly uh, have uh, a great deal of additives. Uh, you're dealing with the byproduct of internal combustion, okay? So uh, continuing on, uh, again, just to piggyback what I just shared, motor oils are the biggest application for lubricant additives, uh, really accounting for the most volume used. Um, you know, think about the reasonings, uh, the reason why. Internal combustion engines produce and generate a large amount of contamination. Every time you fire up that engine, you're producing more and more byproduct of internal combustion. Uh, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, soot, varnish, moisture. Um, most uh, automotive applications are certainly mobile and come into contact with a wide range of contaminants. A great example of that is driving down a dusty road. Even though engines, transmissions, differentials are technically sealed, okay, they still have the tendency to ingress ambient dust, ambient moisture, all right? And then automotive applications experience a wide range of operating temperatures, okay? Um, not everybody drives in what we consider the best ambient temperature environment between 60 and 100 degrees. There are many of you, and, and myself included, that often have to drive our vehicles well below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and for some of you, well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, both instances would require what's known as a multi-grade oil, okay? And we're going to talk about more on that later. But in a nutshell, engine oils fail for three main reasons. Contamination, oil degradation, which affects its life or viability, and additive depletion. Now, you can have companies blend together oils that would last for several thousand miles, okay? Even, even longer than what you would typically see and what is being recommended with modern full synthetic lubricants. But as an end user, okay, we would all be spending uh, a great uh, amount of money for these types of lubricants. So um, again, we'll get into drain interval uh, in just a little bit, but those types of oils can be made um, but it would be at great expense. If you also look at the picture uh, of the beaker to the left, you see an oil that's very heavily oxidized versus one that is, is what I would consider 
new or virgin. If your engine oil looks like the beaker on the left, okay, in my opinion, you have extended your drain and really overextended your drain and, and, and really uh, a more frequent, carefully selected interval should be considered. And quite frankly, for a 60 era, 60s era Corvair, you should always adhere to a, a, a more uh, frequent, carefully selected interval. So I, I'm not well versed on the uh, the actual gas tank and and you know in in the '60s era Corvair and how much fuel it actually holds, and I apologize for that. So let's just say on average, okay, for every five or six Phillips in your Corvair, just just through normal uh, 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 operation. At, between the first and the fifth and sixth Philip, you are producing 90 to 120 gallons of water. Again, these are the byproducts of internal combustion. Three to 10 gallons of unburnt, of unburnt fuel, a half to two pounds of soot and varnish, a quarter to a pound of, 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 of varnish, excuse me, and, and the prior one was uh, soot and carbon, uh, 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 a pound to four pounds of sul uh, sulfuric and nitric acid, and, and again, it, this is why you need to change your oil, okay? Now, take into account the reasons, uh, the very functions, if you will, of an engine oil, to keep components cool, to keep them clean, to keep them lubricated, and to keep them protected. All have to work in order for you to provide the proper lubrication for your classic vintage legacy Corvair engine. Now, we would certainly agree, okay, that applications have changed. And what I have on the screen is a hundred years worth of automotive and aviative history. Now, jump to the left and take, take for instance, the Model T, okay, which produced uh, you know, 20 horsepower. And that, if you think about it, to put that into some perspective, that's the same horsepower equivalent, equivalency of many of today's riding lawnmowers. Jump to the 19, which, which by the way, the, the only engine oil available for the 1908 Model T was literally an uninhibited, unadditized base oil right around the viscosity equivalent of an SA30 or an ISO VG100. But there was literally no additives. It was nothing more than base oil. Fast forward to the 1940s when they started to uh, introduce zinc or an anti-wear additive to the oils to provide that little bit of anti-wear. And even in the 19, early 1950s when they started to introduce multi-grade oils which allowed you an oil that had and, and behaved at a certain viscosity at initial startup, but became more heavier or more viscous under operating temperature. And that was all due to the chemistry, okay? It was basically, uh, many, many individuals were running uh, straight weight, monograde or linear viscosity, which meant it was a 30 weight at startup, 30 weight at operating temp. So in 19, early 1950s was really the advent of multi-grades. To today's supercars, you're talking about very tight clearance engines, very light viscosities, um, high revving, high horsepower, a thousand plus horsepower, and, and these cars are actually street legal. Now you're talking about uh, the Model T with 20 horsepower versus 1,000 horsepower. We've come a long way in 100 years. Uh, jump down to the Wright brothers who used a tallow-infused or fat-infused uh, uh, oil to grease the chain drives on their, uh, on their gliders to the 1950s Piper Cubs that used nothing more than a, a straight 50-weight engine oil in their airplanes to today's modern jetline industry. Now, now, that last one in particular, I want you to think about something for a minute. Now you're flying in a pressurized cigar tube 
at 500 miles an hour at 35,000 feet, where the ambient temperature is minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's neither the time nor the place to have a lubricant related failure. So again, you're talking about, you know, the days of just because it's slippery or, um, uh, you know, as long as it's uh, uh, oil are, are literally long over. And there is a great deal that must be considered before selecting the type of lubricant. And I hope that by the end of my presentation, you'll have a better understanding of what is actually right for your application and really what you should avoid. So the bottom line is this. Oil is the lifeblood of any application. And there really is no bigger maintenance side and more important to extending an application's life, let alone reducing its repair costs. Engine oil is often considered the cheapest component of any application. But when you take a step back and look at the overall picture, you will find that it is absolutely the most critical. As a classic Corvair owner, you should always practice the three P's of maintenance. Be proactive, be predictive, be preventative, just for the overall longevity and better maintenance of your classic automobile. Excuse me, one more. <clears throat> so I'm often asked two questions. Now, when you've worked as long as I have with classic cars, and that's going on 22 years, I get asked the same questions. What about long-term storage? And what about viscosity selection? Okay, now let's take viscosity selection. I generally base, base viscosity selection on three criteria. Main and rod bearing clearance, the anticipated ambient temperature operation, and whatever the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer and or the engine builder recommend. Now, just to jump back to ambient temperature, I'm, I'm just going to assume that the majority of you utilize your Corvairs and again, that very narrow ambient temperature window, but the most optimal uh, ambient temperature uh, to run your car in between 60 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I can tell you that Chevrolet as an OEM was very consistent in their ambient temperature viscosity recommendations. So, so in the 1960s era, when it came to Corvair and the engine oil viscosity, Chevrolet would often recommend at any operating above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, an SAE 30 or straight weight 30, okay? Now, because multi-grades were certainly available and because many had the propensity, if you will, to run their vehicles well below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, Chevrolet would often recommend a 1030, a 10W40, a 15W40, and a 20W50, respectively. So I hope with those viscosities mentioned that I at least touched on some of the viscosities that you may be running in your vehicle. Now, in relationship to long-term storage, and I really want to get into the uh, drain interval, if you will, and what I feel is, is, is the optimal drain interval for your classic car, okay? When I get asked, I often give the answer every 3,000 miles or once a year, whichever comes first. And that's when I get, well, you know, can I change my oil religiously every 3,000 miles in my classic car? But when I push them on the subject, they eventually fess up and say, well, you know, it might take me three or four years to get to 3,000 miles. So all that suggests to me is that every winter, they're storing the car with more and more of that used byproduct or, or, or used oil, that byproduct of internal combustion, that very harmful byproduct that's just going to be left sitting in their engine 
for weeks to months at a time, basically idle or what we call static. Thank you. And so we're, we're looking at that. And what I do is, you know, knowing that many of you only drive your Corvairs maybe 500 miles, maybe 1,000 miles, maybe 1,500 miles throughout the summer before you put it away in the wintertime. And many people get into the habit of driving their vehicles all summer, putting the car away under storage conditions. And then when they pull it back out in the spring, when the ambient temperature is more conducive to driving on a continuous basis, they say, oh, I better change my oil. When they've literally left used oil sitting in the crankcase throughout the winter months. My advice is to change the oil and filter prior to any anticipated lengthy storage period where you know as the end user, the car is going to sit for literally weeks to months at a time of inactivity. And the reason for that is very simple. You never want to leave used oil sitting in the crankcase. I don't care if the oil has 500 miles, 1,000 miles, 1,500, or even 2,000 miles of service. Never leave used oil sitting in the crankcase. Now, next spring, when you're able to pull the car out and drive it, you've had fresh oil sitting in the block all winter. You're good to go. You don't have to change the oil again until the following fall prior to that anticipated storage period, okay? Now, again, we, we talked about multi-grades, but how many of you actually know what the W stands for in a 10W30 or 10W40 or 20W50, okay? It is not weight, ladies and gentlemen. It has nothing to do with weight. The w, w actually stands for winter, and it identifies that oil as being best suited for cold ambient temperature startup conditions. Okay, so I have some pictures there, which is pretty common in what you would see in my hometown of Bradford, Pennsylvania, where it's literally Siberia for four months out of the year. That's a very common site where I live. I hope and, 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 and trust that for many of you, you don't have to deal with this like I do. Uh, maybe you're able to drive your cars, your great Corvairs for many months, maybe eight, nine, 10 months at a time. If that's the case, then maintain that uh, once a year or 3000 mile interval, whichever comes first. And if you're ever driving in this type of situation or starting the engine, well below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when you may wanna consider running the 1030, 1040, or 2050 respectively. You have to remember that the bearing clearances in a 60s era engine were literally designed for the viscosity grades available in the 1960s. So that's why those three multi-grade oils are still recommended by Chevrolet today in, in most of their uh, classic vintage legacy equipment, uh, specifically their engines. So let's, let's get into supplements. Now, I talked a great deal, I wish I had longer, about the actual additives that are being used. So you know, at, at least at this juncture, that you know everything must work in a synergistic fashion. It's all about the perfect balance. So when you, when you take an oil supplement and one of the more popular oil additives, aftermarket additives or supplements today is zinc, okay? Because everybody has done their research and they know that the modern oils have all seen a drastic reduction in the amount of anti-wear chemistry. And that was all done to protect and extend the life of sensitive emission systems like O2 sensors and catalytic converters. Well, to a 60s era Corvair owner, they could care less about protecting the catalytic converter. You don't have one, okay? So again, those that have done their research know that the modern oils have seen that reduction in chemistry. So they run out and they buy an aftermarket zinc additive. Now, again, remember what I said, engine oils are a precise balance 
of additives and base oils. So when you add an aftermarket additive, not only can you disrupt that perfect formulation balance, but now you've literally changed the identity of that oil. It's almost like using one more puzzle piece to a picture, a beautiful picture that's already put together. And I will often say that if you have to rely on an additive to change some aspect of your oil's performance, guess what? You're using the wrong oil. Everything you need is self-contained in that pen grade one quart bottle. And you're talking about an engine lubricant that was specifically designed and tailored for the protection of the flat tappet cam and all of the valve train componentry in those older legacy engines, the lifters, the wrist pins, the main and rod bearings, and yes, especially the cams, okay? So please, uh, please don't use aftermarket additives. They are absolutely unnecessary. And that is with pen grade one or any other engine lubricant you choose. Do not use additives. And this is what you're protecting, ladies and gentlemen. This is your flat tap of cam. And here is a shot of, of your roller cam, not so much in the 60s era, but for many of you that have, uh, you know, upgraded your engine or modified your engine, uh, maybe you went to a roller follower rather than a flat tappet. You know, it's, it's an interesting to note that in the needle bearings, in the rollers, uh, they're starting to see a lot of premature wear because, again, they're running modern oils that were all designed with a different agenda in mind. And, again, that was to protect and extend the life of catalytic converters. Uh, I, I left this slide in only to uh, uh, share with you that when it comes to high temp, high shear, okay, high temp, high shear is essentially the higher the high temp, high shear rate of an engine oil, the better the oil does at protecting bearings under highly stressed, highly loaded conditions. And remember some of those unique characteristics of the Pennsylvania grade base cut that's used in all the pen grade one formulations, that tenacious clingability, that natural metal wetting characteristic, that affinity, if you will, to metal surfaces, all leads to that high temp, high shear rate. Pen grade one oils have some of the highest high temp, high shear rates in the industry, which means simply unparalleled protection. And that's really pen grade one's claim to fame is its protection value. And again, this really kind of spells it out why, why this product has been available for 50 plus years. Uh, it's been around since uh, the, the late 60s when it rolled out as the original Kendall GT1 high performance oil. Some of the applications that you would typically expect uh, to see pen grade one in, uh, there you have it. Uh, classic vintage legacy, historic muscle car, street rod, high performance oils, um, it's, it's just to name a few. Let's talk about the air-cooled engines. <clears throat> now, air-cooled engines, as you know, create an extraordinary demand upon the engine oil. Air-cooled engines, as you know, lack a radiator and must rely on the ambient air to cool the engine. Now that's a very tough task given when most of you drive your Corvairs, you know, in the spring, summer months, uh, a lot of stop and go, a lot of idling that you're doing, everybody's out driving, not to mention the very high ambient temperature. Now what happens is that the engines create hot spots that the longer the oil is exposed, will certainly lend to a more pronounced varnish condition and more of an aggressive oxidative state. Now, using a conventional mineral-based product like pen grade one is certainly uh, allowable as long as you adhere to a more carefully selected uh, frequent interval. 
And as you know, and I, and I can honestly attest to this, some of those air-cooled Corvair engines can exceed 350, 375. I've even seen 400 Fahrenheit. Okay, so, so again, you're talking about the combination of the tenacious clingability, the high temp, high shear, the thermal stability. Again, these are all uh, uh, performance characteristics of that Pennsylvania grade base cut that's been in this product for over half a century. Now let's talk about synthetics because there was a question posed to me about, you know, I, I've up, upgraded my engine or I've modified my engine. I have turbo this and turbo that. This is really for those, to begin, this is really for those that have the 60s era stock Corvair engines, okay? A lot of times you read about synthetics. Just because it's in, is, is a, the product is a synthetic oil doesn't necessarily mean that it's better than anything in the market, okay? My professional opinion is that if your vehicle was born and bred on conventional mineral base stock, like it was in the 1960s, that vehicle should only run conventional mineral base stock, okay? Pen grade one high performance oil, the, the straight weight 30 is 100% conventional. All of our multi-grades contain a partial synthetic component. And when I mean partial, that's exactly what the name describes. There's literally less than 10% PAO or synthetic component. And that was only incorporated about 15 years ago to help with the high temperature stability side of things. But it was never done at the expense of the remaining Pennsylvania grade base stock. Okay. So you look at some of the advantages of synthetic oils today. High temperature stability. Synthetics do a wonderful job with high temperatures. Uh, low temperature fluidity or pumpability. Uh, where I live, where it's Siberia four months out of the year, uh, having a full synthetic is absolutely necessary. But what I found with synthetics is most people run synthetic oils for one reason, and that is the better volatility that they offer, which simply equates to the oils lasting longer which promotes extended drain. Now I can tell you with all the Corvair clubs that I presented to, all the Corvair folks and any classic car owner that I've come in contact with, I have yet to meet an end user that placed more of a value on extended drains over the ultimate protection of his or her, her engine. And they get better protection with a conventional mineral-based oil that that engine was born and bred on. Some disadvantages, obviously cost. Um, you're talking about systems that have never seen a synthetic oil. You know, the first synthetics were very tough on the seals in many of the classic engines, that first PAO chemistry, that polyalpha olefin, which would li literally cause the seals to swell, uh, crack, and then ultimately uh, start leaking. Um, today's synthetic oils are much better. They've addressed that. That's not an issue. But my biggest knock against synthetic oils is that they simply lack the clingability of, uh, you know, a good quality conventional mineral-based oil like Pen Grade One. What's very, why is that important? And and maybe some of you are asking that. You've just changed the oil and filter in your car, okay? And you, you've left it sitting in your garage for several weeks to months for your winter storage. And I want you to know that because of that clingability, the oil never leaves the surface. So when you change the oil and filter, you take the car around the block for a few times, get it up to operating temp, then you get it back, shut it down and leave it alone. When you pull that car out for the very first time in that spring, and turn that key where almost 70% of engine wear occurs just by simply doing this. With pen grade one, you are always protected from what's known as that dry start scenario. Okay, that's what I mean about clingability. With modern, very light labristic synthetic oils, when you shut down that motor, where do you think that oil is going without that clingability? Right down into the drain pan, okay? 
So I know there's more on synthetics. Again, we just don't have the time and I apologize for that. We can get into more, more into the weeds if you really want to, if we have a part two. Um, and th this really is, is the difference between synthetic. You're still starting with the conventional base soil. You can see on the top there with a conventional mineral base soil, something that would, would have been available in the 1960s where the molecules are not uniform size, okay? Whereas with synthetic oils, it's, it's a further refining process where you, you turn up a little bit more heat, you add a little bit more pressure, and you literally crack those molecules to a more uniform size. And what that simply means is more planned, predictable results. You know, I, this is when I often interject that, you know, recently they polled uh, uh, individuals that lease cars for two years or less. You know the number one reason given why people lease cars for two years or less? They never have to lift the hood which means they, have, they, they, they don't do a lick of maintenance. So here's Mr. Myth, Mrs. Smith coming in to buy or lease, excuse me, their brand new vehicle for two years. They drive it for two years without changing the oil. They bring it back, they hand over the keys, they get a new set of keys. Here you are, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, here's your brand new car. Uh, we're gonna put your uh, older car on the lot. Best of luck to you, see you in two years. Now, can you imagine the condition of that oil, even though you're using a synthetic oil, which is designed to last, provide better volatility. Can you imagine the condition of that oil? I've seen oil like that come out of police cruisers, taxi cabs, municipality vehicles that often sit running idle, very tough on the engine and the oil, uh, very short trips, but have full synthetic oils in them. I've seen full synthetic oils come out of these applications literally looking like a triple ot grease, okay? So it's just something to consider. Um, now, not to upset anybody, but I, I, I like to get up on my soapbox here regarding uh, zinc and phosphorus chemistry, which I, I touched on just briefly a bit ago, and then ethanol fuel. And uh, I don't know about any of you, but you, you start, you're starting to see more and more of these ethanol uh, 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 free stations popping up. And I, and I really want to at least shed some light on that topic for you and, and allow you to make up your mind. Um, but in relationship to these catalytic converters, again, a 60s era Corvair owner could care less about protecting the catalytic converter. You don't have one. So why you would ever want to use a modern day lubricant is really beyond me. Harken back to the 60s and think about the oils and especially the viscosities that would have been avail available. Obviously, the oils back in the 60s had uh, much higher levels of anti-wear than uh, when compared to any of today's oil options. And again, you don't have the cat to worry about, but uh, in 1975, when they mandated catalytic converters, essentially every vehicle manufactured since comes with a catalytic converter. So again, the reduction of anti-wear, and it's more so the, the, it's the phosphorus that can literally volatize and poison the sensitive catalyst within the, uh, said catalytic converter. The platinum, the, the palladium, the rhodium, whatever's in there, uh, the, it's the phosphorus that has that adverse effect. And in a ZDDP package, zinc dialkyl phosphate, they, that's your anti-wear package, the phosphorus content is roughly 90% of the zinc content. So when the government reduced, said all you oil manufacturers were gonna to, re to reduce the amount of, of phosphorus in your oil, down went the phosphorus, down went the zinc, and now you have the anti-wear levels that you have today. So again, uh, don't have to worry about it in relationship to uh, protecting the cat, you don't have one, but don't get into the trap of using modern day oils that were literally designed with a different agenda in mind. Now, this is what I meant about uh, E85 or ethanol fuel. Uh, they were really developed to run in conjunction with the modern applications today. Uh, a lot of stainless steel componentry, the, 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 the componentry in general was literally designed to run this modern fuel. Okay, E85 was uh, oils were essentially designed 
with rust protection and emulsion retention in mind, phase separation was also critical. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little technical here, but phase separation was also critical because E85 fuel has a very nasty habit of collecting and holding moisture. Now, where we run into issues with that, especially if somebody's running an older uh, uh, engine oil like Pen Grade One, is, is that, you know, without that proper maintenance and they store the cars in the winter, they will literally come out in the, in the springtime to change the oil and they notice that they have a lot of gelling that has occurred. And again, that's just an adverse effect from running the E85 fuel on top of the used oil, the byproduct of internal combustion. <clears throat> okay, so again, uh, we're running out of time, but uh, this is just a depiction of the phosphorus level. And you can see there how much it has dro literally uh, dropped the phosphorus levels from the, S the API SH, the service category, Spark United SH category, which was at 1200 parts per million, and it's already down, the very latest API service category, SP, uh, is right around 800 parts per million of zinc versus pen grade one, which has enhanced levels. It's even higher than 1,200 parts per million. It's actually at 1,500 parts per million of zinc. <clears throat> Ken, before you leave the subject of E85, we did just yeah. get a question into the chat. Um, does 10% ethanol gas present the same problems no. as E85? No, that's a great question. Okay, it, it's really the, the higher concentration of ethanol really seems to be the culprit. Um, it, as you know, today at the pump, it's 10%, it's 15% ethanol. It is what it is. But if you notice, let me see if I can go back. If you notice, I have there in yellow, uh, for the members, there's a website, puregas.org. And what that will do will is if you visit that, that will allow you to see all the ethanol-free fueling stations within your area. Or if you travel out of area with your Corvair, you can use that puregas.org to see all the ethanol-free fueling stations. If I owned a 60s era Corvair stock engine, I would not run uh, E8, I certainly wouldn't run E85, and I would try to avoid E85 altogether. But to answer your question, the 10%, 15%, uh, I have certainly not read or, or any research done suggests to me that it's an issue, okay? So uh, I wanted to show the API service symbol, which really is the standard worldwide way to determine the viscosity of a gasoline or diesel engine. If you were to walk into a Walmart or any other box store uh, and pull a quart of oil off the shelf, more often than not, those are fully licensed oils, meaning the very latest API uh, service category or commercial category. There's a lot of information that's being relayed there. Um, the service category, the viscosity, uh, 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 cold temperature vis, the high temperature viscosity, and of course the ILSAC category. You will not find a donut or API service symbol on the back of a pen grade one quart bottle for one reason. We simply did not want to be guidelined by the amount of anti-wear we incorporated in the pen grade one high performance oil. So they are essentially unlicensed oils. Now that is very appealing to a classic car owner, especially one that has uh, pre-1975 hardware, okay? Just a few more slides, Jeanette. Um, a lot of times you hear about individuals that have done you're, their research. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say you're good on time, so keep okay, going. Okay. Um, a lot of times diesel oil is uh, utilized in a Corvair engine because again, more and more people are doing their research. They know there's been a reduction in anti-wear chemistry in passenger car motor oils, but you haven't technically seen that much of a drop in anti-wear in heavy duty diesel. And that really is the only reason. They're not using diesel oil because it's diesel oil. They're using it because they know it still affords them the levels of anti-wear that, that is 
adequately protecting their flat tap and cam. Yes, they share the same anatomy, the same makeup, but in relationship to diesel versus gasoline engine oils, diesel oils certainly contain more additives per volume. They're, they were designed with a different agenda. Uh, one such additive is, is, is calcium. Um, you know, diesel engines have to deal with the byproduct of soot. So you're, you're, you have the chemistry that's really uh, uh, implemented, if you will, to help combat the byproducts of the compression ignited or commercial grade engine. And of course, gas and di uh, uh, diesel engines have different lubrication requirements. Would a diesel engine oil work in your Corvair? Yes. And quite frankly, I would rather you consider using a diesel engine oil over any uh, modern PCMO in the market today, just from the simple fact that you're getting more anti-wear. But is it necessarily the right oil for your classic engine? And the answer is no. I still think you should run a, a passenger car motor oil, one designed and tailored specifically for that purpose. So these are the pen grade one high performance oils that are readily available today. Um, we're gonna talk about breaking oil in just a second because there was a great, a great question even tonight that Jeanette, uh, Jeanette had forwarded me. But you can see, um, you know, we have a limited number of viscosities, but again, these are the viscosities that are commonly used and what you would typically expect to find in the service manual or owner's manual of the older, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s uh, era uh, vehicles. Um, <clears throat> to get into the gear oils, and, and we'll get back to the braking oil in just a second, but as a classic car lubricant provider, we certainly have our share of, of gear lubricants that are designed specifically for those systems, uh, let's say that contain yellow metallurgy. Now, to my knowledge, most Corvairs require an 8090 GL5 conventional mineral gear oil, okay? Now, the difference between a GL4 and a GL5, because you've probably seen uh, reference to both, a GL4 is essentially, you're talking about a sulfur, phosphorus, or EP chemistry, all done to protect the gears, okay? And, but you have different levels. So a GL4 is essentially a, a half treat rate of a GL5 chemistry laden product, which means a GL4 would be safe to use in any transmission or differential that has soft yellow metal like brass, bronze, or copper, okay? A GL5 is designed for the hypoid gear protection. And if you have a GL5 system, you should use a GL5 lubricant, which is what we have. Do not use a GL4 or vice versa, okay? One's not gonna be enough. One's, one's chemistry is too much and too aggressive. So we also carry a limited slip GL58090. Uh, I don't believe that that's uh, the case with Corvair, but it's simply worth mentioning. Um, and you can see there, uh, again, I just wanted to highlight uh, Chevrolet, probably from 1950 to the mid eighties, what they would typically recommend uh, in their applications. And really in, in the spirit of discussion here, what you would typically find uh, in your service manual for your Corvairs, okay? Um, I, I, was, I was once asked, what would I run if I owned a Corvair? I'm very old school mentality minded. I like to run the heaviest, most viscous oil I can, as long as the bearing clearance and ambient temperature support it. Now, if you are consistently operating between 60 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then there's really no reason to select a multi-grade oil. That's when you want the benefit of the added film strength and shear stability that a mono-grade straight weight or linear viscosity provides. Whereas with the multi-grades, if you're one that has the tendency to drive your vehicle clear up until the snow starts to fly, you know, let's say a late fall or early spring day when the ambient temperature is well below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 
that's when I would say you may want to consider a multi-grade and consider using it year round, okay? Now back to break in oil, uh, the, the question revolved uh, around uh, uh, steel cast iron rings and, and the use of non-detergent. If you are in fact breaking in an engine and you have to successfully seat uh, steel cast iron rings, the only type of oil that I would recommend is in fact a non-detergent oil. And that would be a non-detergent 30 weight. Now, the reason for that is very simple. Without any detergency, remember one of the byproducts of internal combustion is varnish. So without the detergency, you had a lot of varnish that would literally build up during the run process. And it was actually that varnish that would help facilitate ring seating. Now today's more flexible chromoly rings, not only is it good to run a product that has detergency, but also one that has controlled levels of anti-wear, not high levels, but controlled levels. The reason for that is very simple. Any good quality engine build worth their salt will tell you that they expect some wear to occur during that initial run-in phase. And it's actually that supportive wear that can help facilitate ring seating. Again, this is a topic I could spend two hours on, but be, and I apologize, please, I apologize that I'm giving you this 30,000 foot view. There's so much to talk about there, but I, I hope I've answered that question. And if not, Jeanette will certainly provide you uh, with my email address and contact information. And by the way, I encourage any of you uh, to reach out to me at any time. I'm just a phone call and an email away. Now, I'm, uh, one thing, if, if, if there are some of you, I, I would assume, buy multiple cases of oil at a time, okay? And, and if for those of you that do, I'm often asked, what is the shelf life of a packaged good? Now you can see there's some of the pictures that I have, which really kind of detail what I would consider an optimal storage condition. Now, what I typically say is as long as the oil is stored in a cool, dry environment, elevated off the floor, away from any excess heat, light, or moisture, you know, things that could cause the oil to oxidize quicker, uh, a typical three-year shelf life can be expected. Now, I've known packaged goods, like you see there in the picture, quart bottles, to last uh, or, or be viable up to 10 years. But I certainly wouldn't uh, recommend or endorse its use because, again, it's 10 years old. It's a decade old. Um, so I hope that helps uh, for those that literally store oil for later use, uh, just be careful where you store it. And again, work on the typical three year shelf life. Um, I have one last thing I wanna share with all of you. Now, my youngest sister is a school teacher and in her classroom hangs a poster titled 212, the extra degree. And for those of you that have never seen that. It simply reads that at 211 degrees, water is hot. At 212 degrees, water boils. And with boiling water comes steam. And with steam, ladies and gentlemen, you can power a train. And the simple message to take from that is how one extra degree can make all the difference. Pen grade one high performance oil, without me sounding like a salesman, I'm not a salesman, I'm a tech guy, but without sounding like a salesman, pen grade one gives you that extra degree. It is the absolute best engine oil lubricant for your classic Corvair, <clears throat> unparalleled protection, okay? So with that, I want to say thank you so very much for your time and, and inviting me into your homes this evening. I hope that you do uh, want to continue, maybe do a part two someday. I just want you to know that I'm more than willing to do that. 
Jeanette, thank you so much for having me. I hope this was what you wanted. I hope I was able to help some of your members. And again, I'm just a phone call and an email away. Thank you so much, Ken. And I just want to share with the folks that are on the call, uh, when Ken volunteered to do this and I told him he had an hour, he was uh, like, oh my gosh, I usually do this in two and a half hours. So he did a great job in condensing and respecting everybody's time, given that I know we have East Coast people. Um, I also want to share that this presentation is recorded. It will go out on the um, Corvair Society of America YouTube channel that you can search for and look for. Um, we just had one more question come in that I'll uh, bring up. And if anybody else has any other questions, you're welcome to put them on chat and, and Ken will stay on. Before you leave the chat, I just wanna let you know we will have a meetup next month in May, third Thursday. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be live from the new Corvair Museum in Springfield. So um, you guys will get to have a tour of the museum by our museum folks down in Springfield. We're going to do it live. Um, real quick, a good question. Where is Penn Grade sold? Ken? Okay, what I would suggest, yes, it, it, this is where I would usually uh, defer to my colleague, Nick Dixon. You know, just an interesting point. Uh, Nick Dixon is, I've often been uh, uh, called the face of Penn Grade One. My, my good colleague and friend, Nick Dixon, is literally the heart of Penn Grade One. Um, so this is where I would typically defer to him. But if your members were to visit PennGrade1.com, PennGrade1.com, we have a store locator or where to buy. If you simply click that hyperlink, uh, we have a, uh, just put in your zip code and everybody within a 25, 50 mile, 100 mile radius that deals or sells pen grade one in your area will pop up. And what's nice about that is you can call ahead. Um, you can do some shopping. Um, it's a very simple process. Um, the other means is to order online through JEGS, Summit, or Amazon. Now, if you want to call me and say, hey, Ken, I'm interested in ordering a case of straight 30 weight or a case of 20W50, what is the part number for that? If you have the part number, it's a very easy process for those that want to have the oil sent directly to your home, okay? Um, but obviously, I, I would prefer you, you visit our dealers, distributors. We, they're all over the country, ladies and gentlemen. Just visit PennGrade1.com use your zip code and they'll all pop up for you or you can always call me. So. Okay, um, and I do have one more question that folks were asking to make sure gets uh, asked. Um, can you tell us the difference between your high performance SAE 30 and your SAE 30 racing oil? Oh, what a great question. Okay. Yay. Thank you, Donald. Now, now listen, you said high performance 30 and you said between your high performance SAE 30 and your SAE 30 quote unquote racing oil. They are exactly the same product. And, and what, he, what he's referring to is for many years, um, the racing oil, what you would find on that quartz, uh, the verbiage indicating racing oil, um, it was just older stock. It was older label stock. Um, when the labels were redone, to the, its current form, you know, the racing uh, uh, name just simply disappeared, okay? It, it, it's, it's under that new picture. Now, if you can see on the screen, there's no reference uh, other than Penn Greg, okay? Uh, I'm sure there's reference on of racing oil or high performance elsewhere on that label, but there is absolutely no difference. And, and you know, back in, in let's say 2016, 2017, we're still fumbling through the acquisition. I was literally in dealers and distributors where we had, you know, the racing oil sitting next to the brand new bottle. So you can imagine the concern, the confusion that that, that created for our loyal end users. So that's a great question, but to answer it, they are one in the same product. And the, the other way you can 
confirm the product that you have is via the part number that's listed just above the, the barcode on the back of the label. Thank you. And thanks to the folks that are asking questions in the chat. I think we'll um, wrap up. And again, thank you so much, Ken, for coming again. Um, some of you may remember that Ken made this presentation, or I should say the presentation, at the uh, Pittsburgh Convention. And that's where um, some folks said, wow, there's so much to know about oil and so much to learn. So um, if you uh, want to have them come back for another meeting, uh, meetup, we can do that and do a part two and learn even more. But uh, I hope this gave everybody a little bit of a, a flavor of how much there is to learn here. So um, with that, I think we're gonna call it an evening. And again, thank you so much, Ken, for your, um, oh, I'm already getting uh, messages saying, let's do a part two. So there you go. So we'll have them come back. <laughs> That's great, thank you guys. Thank you everybody for coming and enjoying our meetup. This is part of the privileges of being a member of Corsa and uh, we hope you enjoy them and you're gonna be getting a survey. Uh, I do it every meeting. I love getting your feedback and the board loves seeing what kind of presentations you like. Um, we're trying to get more technical. This is kind of technical feel here, but uh, next month we're gonna have some fun at the museum, a night at the museum. Good night, everybody, and have a great uh, rest of the week. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Ken.